definitely an introduction to Elasticsearch, so just to set expectations. If you already know a fair bit about Elasticsearch, uh, you probably will find the first half of this session a little bit sort of stuff you already have seen. Uh, but the latter half of the session, we'll get into more of the .NET uh, things. Um, in terms of um, uh, the slides, this link here, this bit.ly link, uh, if you need to have a copy of the slides, this will take you to a version of them. So if you want to review them later or access any of the resources, then uh, you can go and grab that, and that will have a link to the code at the end of it as well. Um, my name's Steve. I'm a Microsoft MVP, uh, Pluralsight author, and engineer at Elastic. Uh, you can find me online. I'm at Steve J. Gordon on Twitter, and uh, I blog less frequently at the moment at stevejgordon.co.uk. So a little bit of an introduction to Elastic as a company. Um, many people have heard of a sort of Elasticsearch and assume that the only thing that we do is Elasticsearch. Uh, but today we sort of build uh, more and more things on top of what we call a single stack. So this, this sort of uh, set of blocks in the middle kind of represents the sort of abstract concept of our stack that we'll talk more about in a moment. And then around that we have our sort of solutions uh, that we build on top of those. And those are very similar to the types of things that you may be building on top of Elasticsearch yourself. Um, so you're using the, the tooling and the, the under underlying technology of Elasticsearch to kind of enable technologies and software on top. So just to kind of give a bit of a summary of the sorts of things that we offer kind of out of the box, uh, we have a product called Enterprise Search, which is uh, mostly focused, has a few sort of different uh, pieces that it uh, does for you, but it's mostly focused around sort of accessing data within your organization uh, and ensuring that you can find things across sort of all of the disparate systems that you may be running there. So many companies now, you have, you know, GitHub repositories, you have things in Salesforce, in Slack, in Google Drive, etc. With an enterprise search, you can have that index, all of that data across all of those sources, such that you can then have a single point of search. Because typically, you know, there's a lot of good organizational information that kind of gets written once, answers a question, and then is never found again. Uh, and by enabling um, your organization to refine that information when people are looking for it, you avoid repetition and obviously make sure that that data doesn't just sort of uh, get read once and then die. Uh, we do a few other things in Enterprise Search. If you're running web services and websites, you can have a, a web crawler, index data across your, your websites, and then make that available through Search, uh, and do things like App Search as well. Uh, around the observability space, we have a few uh, different uh, pieces, but mostly this is about sort of monitoring your servers, services, and applications uh, in your various environments. So, uh, the, the, the typical example from an application perspective would be application performance monitoring. We have application performance monitoring agents that you can install into the applications running various different languages in your organization to collect information like traces about all of the activity in those applications. Uh, so, for example, the .NET APM agent can be turned on to auto-profile all of the things like making external HTTP calls, database calls, calls into services uh, like cloud services, Azure Functions, uh, in your app and send that through to our observability dashboard that you can then view, build metrics, build alerting uh, around things that are happening in your applications um, and uh, make sure you fully understand what's happening in the normal environment and then when you're running into situations where you're outside of your normal environment. Um, security is very similar, but obviously with a security focus. So this is about sort of running agents on devices within organizations to collect information about potential vulnerabilities, unpatched software versions, and also about doing uh, sort of ML and AI over the data that we collect to understand where there may be potential incoming threats to your organization that you want to deal with. Uh, unusual activity, maybe you know, a set of things happening unusual activity from a set of IP addresses that you don't recognize, doing things that might seem suspicious. Uh, through the AI modeling, we can understand and prevent, present you sort of proactive alerting around those potential threats. So getting into the stack itself, uh, the core of the stack is um, Elasticsearch. This is where the company began. Uh, this is the core product that does the data storage. It's where we do the search and an analytics over that data. Um, and so fundamentally, it's kind of the heart of any system that you will build uh, with the Elastic technology. But to make that easier to work with and, and to be able to co coordinate the activity in there, we have Kibana, which is our UI. Uh, so this is where you can manage not only the Elasticsearch servers themselves and configure your environment and um, on the infrastructure side of things, but also where you can work with your data by visualizing it, building dashboards, building alerting, uh, doing ad hoc querying, etc. cetera. 
So it's a very powerful UI. It exposes most of the functionality of Elasticsearch to you, um, and it's very quick to get up and started um, if you're building Elasticsearch solutions. We then need to get data into Elasticsearch. Um, so we're now sort of talking about data ingestion. So later on, we'll be looking at an example with a .NET application where we're going to ingest data um, through a .NET, uh, basically a console application. Um, but there are many common scenarios in organizations where you might want to collect data, particularly from like VM servers that you're running in your environments. Um, and for that, we offer uh, a few different mechanisms. So the newest of those is Elastic Agent. Uh, this is a very simple way to get started with data collection because you install the agent, want, agent once on your machines, uh, configure it to talk to a centralized fleet server, and then once you have that configured from that fleet server, you can control what is collected from each of those devices. And then through the Elasticsearch dashboards, you can view that information, start building again dashboards and things around it. Um, if you want to have um, a little bit more fine-grained control on what's running, Beats is kind of our older technology for doing this. So with Beats, what you would do is install individual what we call Beats agents. So file Beat for collecting information from files, log Beat specifically targeting logs, um, that kind of thing. And that would then enable those data to be sent into Elasticsearch as well. Elastic Agent is kind of the newer technology that avoids all of that manual work. Um, Logstash is another ingestion technology, um, as the name suggests, particularly focused around log data. Um, so with this, you point it at a directory or a set of directories that you want to collect the log data from. As those logs are written to files, Logstash will parse them, perform some kind of transformation on that data, and then index it into Elasticsearch. And there's all sorts of things you can do there in terms of deciding which pieces of the data you're interested in, how you might want to transform them, do maybe GeoIP lookups on IP data, et cetera, before it gets stored into Elasticsearch. In terms of um, running this stuff, um, Elastic Cloud is our preferred and recommended way to get started because it takes a lot of the manual overhead of understanding details around how you manage a cluster, how you make sure it's secure, configured correctly, um, scaled correctly for all of your needs, and that you've got backups and things in place. Elastic Cloud takes a lot of that away from you. And you can just determine, OK, we need to store this amount of data. We need to have this capacity in terms of our search and ingest load. Uh, and then away you go. And we do all of the work to make sure it's configured to best practices for you. Um, and you can quickly spin these things up and spin them down. We'll look at that shortly uh, in a demo. Of course, uh, there are cases where you might want to work with on-prem. Typically, this tends to be either organizations that are you know, transitioning with legacy Elasticsearch clusters they already manage, or it's people that are in environments where you can't perhaps put your data into a public cloud. Uh, and so in those scenarios, one option you have is running Elasticsearch standalone. In this scenario, you have full responsibility for installing Elasticsearch on as many of the servers as you need to scale out to your needs. You then have to configure that. You have to make sure that you've got your backups in place, your you know, security configuration is correct, et cetera. So there is more management overhead, but obviously more fine-grained control as well. If you want a middle ground, we have Elastic Cloud Enterprise, which is basically the Elastic Cloud sort of technology set um, that, that can be installed and run in your own environment within your own network environment. Um, and so that gives you the kind of UI layer of Elastic Cloud, um, but within a secure environment for you. And if you're running Kubernetes, we have a similar offering there where you can run this on your Kubernetes environment. Coming in the near future, we have um, a serverless offering that's being worked on at the moment, Elasticsearch Serverless. And so this goes a step beyond what Elastic Cloud does today in the sense that you won't need to understand anything really about the server infrastructure behind the scenes. Elastic Cloud abstracts some of it away from you, but there's still pieces and decisions that you need to make in terms of scaling. With serverless, you will just basically decide what sort of load you need for your ingest requirements and for your search requirements, scaling it with sliders as necessary, um, and we will do the work behind the scenes to provision on top of a newly architected version of Elastic Search. So the existing architecture today you know, there's still, even in cloud, some decisions you have to make about transitioning data through what we call different sort of tiers of types of data. Hot data, which is kind of the live data, moving it into warm and then eventually cold and frozen tiers as the data matures and maybe you need to store it, but you don't need to search it as often. And there are still decisions you need to make about scaling those with the appropriate disk capacities, the types of VMs you want to run on top of in the cloud. With the new architecture, you really just think about that indexing and search workload and then you scale appropriately. Um, and we do all of the work behind the scene to provision on top of our new stateless version of Elasticsearch that can run on top of cloud native services like blob stores and queues and service buses and things behind the scenes, such that we can just give you a much more um, 
simple offering, really, that you can just get up to speed with even quicker um, and hopefully give you some really good cost benefits there as well by leveraging those kind of cloud platforms. So let's have a quick look at um, a demo of Elastic Cloud. Um, so I'm going to, I'm in what I, we call the sort of uh, the deployment section of Elastic Cloud here. I'm just going to refresh and check I've got internet, which I do. I already have some existing um, cloud deployments running, but I'm going to create a deployment um, while, we, while we're sort of doing the rest of the talk. So we can give it a name. I'm just going to call this one demo. So the first decision we have to make is where do we want to provision the resources for this? So we have the option of running um, the Elastic Cloud uh, instance either on Google Cloud, Azure, or AWS. So you can provision this near where you're already running your other cloud services um, and within the sort of regions that you already have uh, your other sort of uh, functions or whatever running uh, in your environment. I'm going to choose Azure just because uh, that's what I tend to work with most. Uh, I have no idea what is the best region for Romania, so I'm going to choose London and just stick with that because um, I know where I am there. And the version uh, also defaults to like the latest version of Elasticsearch. We're going to stick with that. At the moment, you can see uh, the cost of this would be 58 um, cents an hour, which is already pretty reasonable. But for a demo or for a prototype, you can reduce this further. So. In here, this is where you still have that little bit of kind of infrastructure leaking through to you that you have to make decisions on. How much hot data are you going to have? How much data is going to be constantly being indexed and searched in your live environment, which is kind of the default scenario for most data. So in this case, um, the first decision I'm going to make actually is I don't need redundancy for a demo, so I'm going to drop down to one zone. Obviously, this is now at risk of fault tolerance because we've only got one zone running our Elasticsearch server, um, but for a demo, that's fine. For the size, this is where, again, you have to make some decisions over provisioning an appropriate VM with capacity. Now, of course, you can come back and scale this and add uh, different sizing in different zones for your different sort of tiers of data as you sort of mature. Um, for now, I'm going to drop down to the cheapest machine because I don't have much data to store. I don't need much memory or CPU to run that. So the other tiers, and there's nothing uh, configured by default. We don't need any uh, tiers. We will have a Kibana instance running so that we can access the UI layer. Um, and we don't need any integrations running for APM agents or running enterprise search. So we've now dropped down to three cents an hour, which is um, even more reasonable for, for getting up to run sort of a demo or a prototype in your organization. So I'm going to click uh, Continue there, and you can see a configuration is in progress. We've got a username and password we need a moment, but I'm just going to leave that running uh, while we continue with the slides. That will take probably about three or four minutes to just provision the VMs and set everything up in those regions that we've asked for it. So let's run through some basic terminology about um, Elasticsearch, uh, because there's a lot of terminology that isn't necessarily crucial to understand, but definitely will help you um, as you sort of work with organizations that are using Elasticsearch or thinking about introducing it. Um, and the first is cluster. I've used the term cluster a few times, um, probably as I've been talking to you. I've also used the term deployment for cloud. And a cloud a deployment is essentially a cluster. It's just obviously it's, it's a slightly higher level of abstraction for you. Um, but a cluster really is just a collection of servers working together to give you the distributed system that is Elasticsearch. Um, and you configure you know, several nodes to run together. Um, and ultimately, what those nodes are going to be responsible for doing initially is storing data and providing the compute for the federated indexing and searching of that data in your organization. There's a little bit of configuration with a cluster, um, and ultimately there is some um, sort of management going on behind the scenes to make sure that cluster stays healthy and can respond to any sort of situations that may arise. Um, it's looking at all of the nodes, and it understands if any of those disappear, how it might need to start rebalancing data within your organization to make sure that you're always, as best as it can, um, you know, resilient to those kind of odd failures. So within a cluster, we have the nodes, which are basically just servers running Elasticsearch. Um, typically, if you're doing this as like a standalone environment, you'll be maybe running VMs that are running Elasticsearch. We highly recommend that all you have installed on that machine is the OS plus Elasticsearch, um, because it will, for high volume of searches and aggregation work, it will need um, most of the memory on that machine probably to, to handle your load. Um, so it's best that it isn't competing for resources with other applications. Um, and in a typical scenario, we recommend that you have at least three nodes for a, a resilient uh, production environment. This gives you the ability for Elasticsearch to distribute the data accordingly such that we could lose one node and still probably be in a pretty happy situation for your data. Nodes have this concept of a role as well. Um, and by default, nodes will spin up with the capability of 
capability of performing most roles that are available. Um, and that's a good default scenario. But as you start to understand your cluster, as you start to grow into sort of the tens, maybe even hundreds of node scenarios, then you might start to want to be a bit more specific about co controlling the sizing for those nodes and what type of activity they're performing to give you a very stable uh, system. And so by controlling the roles, we can do that. So in terms of roles, one of the roles we've already kind of touched on is this, this concept of these different data tiers, hot, warm, cold, and frozen. For that scenario, basically data transitions in your organization um, through what we call a life cycle normally. Um, and so if you think of the typical scenario of like a log ingestion system where you have data coming in, the data initially is hot. Um, you're going to be indexing a lot of data from serv services or applications, and then you'll probably be doing some real-time searching over that and actually doing some sort of analysis on that data. Over time, that data is less and less likely to be searched, um, and those scenarios mean that we can actually push it on to cheaper, more commodity-based hardware. So maybe we have hot tiers running on SSDs, but then we move to uh, spinning disks at the warm tier, and then in, onto cheaper and cheaper sort of hardware platforms as we move through the lifecycle. Eventually, Frozen, which actually stores your data in like a blob store like S3 in Amazon, um, and it rehydrates that data into memory to do searching. So searches and things like that will become slower, but you are obviously paying less for that resource. So as your data is unlikely to be searched, you can store it for maybe compliance reasons on uh, those cheaper nodes um, in order to make sure that you've got access to it should you need it, um, but that you're not paying through the roof for it. Other types of roles that nodes have, there's uh, the concept of machine learning nodes. So if you want to do sort of machine learning analysis over your data and you've got sort of models already prepped or you want to use pre-built models to analyze data that's being indexed in your cluster, you typically will spin up nodes that are dedicated to doing that. They're going to usually have a high sort of RAM and um, CPU profile that you can actually make sure that you can number crunch through all of the data that you have. So making those decisions is something that tends to evolve with time. You don't have to decide on that up front. So say everything is going to kind of just spin up in a default scenario that's kind of sufficient for general services and general getting started scenarios. But as you mature with your cluster, you will start to split those roles out and decide what machines you want to use to perform those different roles. Within the cluster, we can then create one or more indices. Uh, and an index can span nodes, potentially. Um, we'll talk about how we do that in a second. But ultimately, the index is just a collection of documents uh, that have somewhat similar characteristics. Um, so you can think of it similar to like how you would partition data with like tables in a relational system in terms of it's going to be sort of related data. But the difference is that there's no schema with Elasticsearch. You can store any blob of JSON next to any other blob of JSON in the same index, um, and that's totally fine. But you will obviously expect to have some common properties of that data such that you can then search across it all. Um, the two kind of main strategies around how you decide to sort of structure your index um, strategy it depends on the sort of the amount of data and the type of data you have. So for relatively finite amounts of data, like maybe you know sales product data for an online store or for maybe indexing uh, data that's on your blog, that data doesn't grow m massively. It will grow slowly over time, but it's not growing at huge scale, usually. Um, and so in that scenario, a single index may be fine. And a single index can handle millions of documents quite happily. So you've got some room to grow before you would necessarily need to think about how you split that across mul multiple indices. Um, and so for like, yeah, as I say, for a blog, that would be a, a simple use case where all of the data would be related together. Another question that comes up quite often is, you know, should we be using Elasticsearch as the single point of storage for our data, or should we have it alongside our existing data? What, what would you recommend? And the answer is it really is up to you. Many people, you know, if you've already got a blog, blog system, there will be a relational database of some kind probably behind the scenes that holds all of the, the blog posts plus the metadata about them and the information needed to present that in the blog. Um, for searching, some of that data may be relevant, but not all of it. So in that scenario, people will generally duplicate some of the data, the relevant pieces that they expect to uh, be useful in search scenarios or filtering of data. They will index just that portion as a sort of a copy into Elasticsearch and then use those two different data stores for the two different purposes, one for running the system, one for search. Um, but it is totally fine to use Elasticsearch as your sole data source, as long as you make sure that you are backing that data up and you've you know, appropriately scaled everything so that you have resilience uh, should any of the nodes fail. 
The other strategy around um, indexing is more sort of what we call sort of continuous data. So this would be data like logs or metric systems or time series type data that may be continually streaming in uh, to your system and that you're going to be storing. Um, and as I say, these tend to lend themselves best to that life cycle of data where the initial data is very relevant for continuous real-time search, but over time it probably becomes less and less likely that someone's going to be searching over it. For that scenario, what we typically see is we expect you to kind of split your data into multiple indices. Typically, that's done over time. So you might say you create an index per day or per week or per month. The data gets put into there, and then as the month rolls over, a new index is created, and the data goes into that one, while the other index is, is kind of now just essentially a read-only uh, copy of the data that was written at the time. Now, that used to be something you would do manually, and you'd have to roll the index over when you were done with it. Today, we have systems for that. So we have a, a set of services, what we call lifecycle management, index lifecycle management. Uh, you'll see this in the, in the blog and the documentation as ILM. And what that does is automate that process for you, where you can say when an index gets to either a certain capacity or a certain like date is reached every Monday, we want to roll over, it can automate that for you and create the next index uh, with, the, with the indexing name pattern that you've been using. On top of that, we have a concept of data streams, which is really just a way of giving you a single logical endpoint where you would write your data to. And the data stream itself then will have indices backing it and can use the lifecycle management on your behalf to kind of roll those over and just make sure that you're always writing to the correct uh, index. And your application code just needs to know the data stream name that you should be pushing data into. When you have multiple indices for your data, you can perform searches across all of those concurrently. So you can have an, a search that spans more than one index if you need to. So it's totally fine. If you did need to look at log data across a whole two-year period, you could certainly do that still. When we talk about uh, indexes, we also have this concept of sharding data. And this is how we can partition the data essentially across nodes. So in this scenario here, we have a single primary shard, lives on node one, um, and everything looks kind of fine. The problem we have here is that all of the load for that index is now going to be hitting node one. Um, we have no way to spread the load. So if we have a particularly high volume of you know, documents being indexed every second, or we have a high number of very complex searches occurring at the same time, there's no way for us to distribute that load across multiple servers in our organization because everything is configured to be stored on node one. So the way we deal with that is we then shard appropriately. And there's no one-size-fits-all answer for how many shards you should have. It is something that you may need to sort of understand a little bit over time as you start to work out the scale of your own data. Um, but typically, you will start to look at sort of at least maybe a few shards um, for your more sort of heavily used indexes, because that means that you can then actually spread that load. So now the data is roughly equally split across these three nodes. Uh, we do that by hashing the ID of the documents, uh, such that we get a roughly even distribution of the, the storage. It means that the disk capacity on each of those nodes now only needs to be big enough to hold a third uh, of the documents within that index. And any search load will be sent to each of the nodes, gathering their portion of the results, sent back to one node that acts as the coordinator during a search um, that then can do the final kind of aggregation and um, combination of that data. Um, and that's a very sort of common strategy for allowing those searches to run more efficiently and not necessarily need as much memory uh, and CPU on each of the machines in order to handle large volumes of search at once. Now, this scenario is really good for the sort of distributing load, um, but the other scenario that we may have is to consider about fault tolerance. And for that, we need to think about introducing replicas into the system. Because at the moment, if we lose node one, we lose the primary shard one, which means we can only search two-thirds of our data and get incomplete results for you. Um, and it also means that no writes can happen that should be directed to that primary shard one. Um, and so for that, if we introduce replicas, so in this scenario, we've configured a single replica um, um, which means we have a replica of each primary. And so for this scenario, we have a primary replica on node one, and its replicas ended up on node two. Elasticsearch will intelligently work out where to you know, distribute your data, and it can reallocate as time goes on to make sure the data is in the best place. Obviously, it's not going to put the replica on the same node as the primary if it has the choice to not, um, because that means that now, if we lose node one, we have an, a, initially a read-only copy of the data available, so we can still perform complete searches on that second node um, for the, the data that was in the initial primary one shard. And very quickly, Elasticsearch will detect that it is in an unhealthy state 
and determine what it does. So very, very likely what it will do is promote that replica to be a primary if the, the initial primary is lost. Um, and then it will say, OK, I probably need to create a new replica as well. So on node 3, we, in this scenario, we'd probably expect a new replica to be built um, as quickly as possible such that you're back in a, a resilient scenario. And that's why we recommend at least three nodes in a cluster initially, because it gives it a little bit of capacity to sort of juggle things around if any of those nodes fail. We can lose one node reasonably happily. If we lose two nodes, we're probably in more of a bad situation. But technically, things could be shuffled around eventually to recover from that as well. Um, the final uh, concept that we need to talk about is documents. So I've sort of used the term document already. A document in Elasticsearch is simply some JSON that you want to store. Um, Elasticsearch accepts JSON uh, objects um, from you, and it will store those into the data store. And then it will do further work to actually then index that data, data in such a way that you can perform searches over it um, and sort of things like aggregations where you want to group uh, results and things. Um, so as I say, it's schemaless data. We can accept any, any arbitrary JSON object, and we will deal with it accordingly. So if we have a look at a very simple example, and this is where you know, we may have a blog relational database already that has a bunch of other table fields related to sort of running the blog, but maybe we've decided the relevant pieces of that information that we want to duplicate into Elasticsearch just contain the title, some content, uh, a category, the date the, the blog went live, whether it's actually published and visible, and if it's visible, maybe how many upvotes it's had. So these would be the pieces that we say, OK, well, of the data we hold, this is what would be relevant to search. Upvotes is interesting. Um, some people may wonder, well, why would we maybe need that for search? But what's quite common is that you would use upvotes in this scenario as a way of boosting posts that have higher upvotes in your search results so that you can say, you know, not only do we expect to find those that match these keywords, but if they happen to have the highest number of upvotes, give those a higher score such that those, res those results bubble to the top. So that those are the ones that people have already sort of signaled are relevant and useful. Um, when Elasticsearch receives this kind of data, it does, if you haven't done anything initially up front, it does this thing called dynamic mapping. So although Elasticsearch is schemaless, it does use a pro process that we call mapping to determine how it's going to index that data for long-term storage for rapid search. And so the first three fields here are all strings. And so Elasticsearch, by default, stores that in two data structures behind the scenes. For, um, the text field, which is the sort of the primary uh, storage system, that's what enables the full text search to occur. So when we see those kind of data coming in, if there's a text field mapped to that uh, title, for example, then the data will go through a process that we call tokenization and analysis and, and normalization to actually store uh, the data into what we call an inverted index. And that's what enables the very rapid lookup of individual terms or combinations of terms to find out which documents um, have them. So for the title, for example, each of the words or the tokens within there usually get split up as an individual piece. Um, through normalization, we normally, by default at least, remove what we call stop words. So things like it, is, and the, those typically are not going to have any value in search, so we don't need to actually store the fact that those exist in the documents by default. You can configure that, of course, if you want to. Um, we remove those. We normalize and lowercase everything as well. So. Um, the, all of the words, all, the, all of the tokens just get stored in their lowercase form into the inverted index by default. And ultimately, what that is is a lookup for that field, for every word we've ever seen in any document. We have a, a, the list of the words that can be very quickly searched, and then we have the IDs of the documents that contain those words. And that's what enables the full text search to work very efficiently. Now, the other storage type is what we call keywords. So by default, we create this thing called a subfield, which is basically another storage of the same data into a different data structure. And keywords is what supports full tech, uh, sorry, uh, exact match um, searching. So where you want to just be given a word from the end user and try and find that exact word in the exact format that it's been presented. Um, and the example here, the category would be a perfect example where actually we probably don't need it to be stored as a text field by default because we're not expecting anyone to do full text search over that. It's usually going to be a single word or a pair of words. Normally that is going to be kind of like a filter on your blog system where you allow someone to select the particular category they care about and then just present you all of the posts. So for that, a keyword is perfect because once that filter's been clicked, you can just have an exact match search to find all of the documents that contain the keyword that you've um, filtered against. But by default, Elasticsearch doesn't know exactly how you might need to search this data, so it kind of hedges its bets and gives you both storage um, types by default. And this is all possible to be controlled if you need to. Uh, 
The other types here, so we have a date. So although this is a string, Elasticsearch will check if the string parses from a, uh, any of the known date formats that it, it can deal with. And if so, it will store that as a date field, which enables date-based searching and sort of range-based um, querying over your data. Um, is published here just as treated as a Boolean. And then this number here is inferred as a long um, as the, as the best guess. Because we don't see any decimals here, Elasticsearch, if it sees this particular document as the first one being stored in the index, it will decide that upvote is a long field. So obviously, this happens the first time that field is ever seen. And once it's decided, that is the field type for that um, field going forward. So if you want to have control of that, um, we can do what we call explicit mapping of our data. And this is where up front you can tell Elasticsearch, well, when you see a field with this name, treat it as this field type. And we have, as you can see, tens of different field types for different needs. So we can handle like geolocation data stored in various different forms. Um, IP is an interesting example. So if you're, you know, you're getting strings in, but actually they represent an IP address from a log. If you store it as an IP field, that gives us the ability to open up IP-based filtering, IP-based aggregations against that data. You might say, give me all of the documents where the subnet mask matches X, and we can give that for, to you because we've stored the data into a data structure that's suitable for that scenario. Um, so as you learn about the data, you can start to evolve how you decide to determine what your mappings need to be um, and kind of get up, get up and running that way. Now, everything in Elasticsearch is accessed through a HTTP interface, basically. It's a REST-based API, um, and Elasticsearch has a lot of endpoints now. As it's evolved uh, from its initial sort of just sort of search scenario, there's a lot of now endpoints around sort of managing the cluster, configuring things like that lifecycle management, uh, configuring and managing all of the you know, things around like how you want to shard your data and manage your nodes. But additionally, we have endpoints um, for sort of things like machine learning as well. So if you want to be using some of the machine learning capabilities of Elasticsearch, then there's, there's tens of endpoints alone that just represent configuring the models and how you want to run the machine learning jobs on your, or on your system. Of course, that also means that there's lots of data structures involved, because if you think of all those endpoints, each of those has a request and response model, typically. Of those, there's also sub-objects within them in terms of the types of things you might be sending in. And so there's thousands of data structures involved, different query types, aggregation types, and all of those field types that we saw. And if you can imagine working with this data as a, as a, a developer, if you wanted to interact with our, our HTTP API, then if you're using something like .NET and you have to work with just something like .NET um, HTTP client, uh, then you're going to have to know, OK, well, how do I map to the right routes? What route do I need for what type of activity? What type of data should I send? So you're going to have to serialize some data to send up and handle the bytes that you're given back. And so that would be a lot of work if you wanted to manually use more than just a few of the endpoints, really. And so that's why we ship what we call language clients. These are language-specific libraries um, that you can install into your applications that make working with Elasticsearch easier and basically abstract over a lot of the, um, the heavy lifting that you would have to otherwise do to communicate with the Elasticsearch cluster and build up the queries that you want to send. Um, for the strongly typed languages like .NET, Java, and Go, then we offer you know, these strongly typed modeling of the requests and responses for you. Dynamic languages are a bit, obviously a bit easier because they don't necessarily need that. Although even things like uh, Python, we can give like type hints and things uh, to help make working with those APIs easier for you. Um, so I work on the language clients team uh, at the moment, and I maintain the .NET client um, day to day. So in terms of the clients, um, the previous version of the client, the v7 client, so we have two supported versions of Elasticsearch today. The version 7 um, is still supported, and we have the newer version 8 Elasticsearch that's been out for, for many months now. But the previous version of Elasticsearch v7, we had two .NET client libraries that you could use to work with it. We had what we called Elasticsearch.net, which is essentially what we treat as our low-level library that lets you have a kind of dependency-free way of working with the very basic abstraction over dealing with sending requests and responses to endpoints. So we map the endpoints for you. We give you methods to call to call to a particular thing like perform a search. Um, but we expect that you deserialize and serialize the bytes that are going to be sent as, as the, the data, the post data to that endpoint. Um, typically, 99% of you should never be using this directly because it's really going to be used in only high performance scenarios. For most scenarios, you want to be using the library that we call Nest, which is our high level client. And that's where we introduce those strongly typed request and responses um, that model all of the data structures that Elasticsearch offers so that you can just create the requests 
set properties and, and we handle serializing it, um, sending it to the server and then handling the response. We also map to the query DSL that's available in Elasticsearch for uh, performing queries. And we add things on top, sort of .NET idiomatic code for adding operators to combine queries, um, providing what we call helpers that make working with particular scenarios like uh, long-running operations, like ingesting a lot of data easier. Um, and we give you those abstractions on top. So that's version 7, which is, as I say, the previous client. There were some problems with it from a point of view of sort of um, owning it and maintaining it. We know there's over 400 endpoints. Um, modeling all of those types was actually done by hand. Um, and so as the Elasticsearch team has ramped up to tens and even hundreds of engineers, the client's team has maintained one or two people per language client. And you can see that keeping up with the team and what they're building is going to be a bit difficult. So that meant that the API that we were able to expose in each version wouldn't necessarily be 100% up to date with everything you could do on the server, um, which is not ideal. And obviously, it introduces the risk of us missing things uh, for a longer period of time as well. We also depended on an older JSON serializer called GTF8 JSON, which was a high performance serializer, um, but ultimately has now been deprecated. So it's an open source project that's kind of now been retired, so it's no longer maintained. We had to take an internal copy to make modifications to it that we needed that the maintainers couldn't take that were specific to Elasticsearch's needs. Um, and so now we have some tech debt in the code. And obviously, this client's been around for 10 years, so there's a lot of historical decisions. It's gone through different hands over time. Um, and so ultimately, we wanted to reimagine things for version 8 and try and reset a little. And so we now have a new package for version 8 called elastic.clients.elasticsearch, which is the client I've been working on for about a year and a half now. And the big change is that it is majority co-generated. So as a language clients team, we maintain a specification for Elasticsearch's API. Um, and we then use that spec to, in, in the case of .NET, I build a code generator that reads the spec, builds up a syntax tree using the Roslyn compiler APIs, and then generates my, my classes. So it's generating thousands of C-sharp classes, modeling all the requests and responses based on the spec. And this gives us consistency um, with that spec, and it gives us a standardization of, of how we approach modeling each of those types across the code base. Uh, we've moved to the Microsoft System.Text.JSON serializer. Again, this is a high-performance serializer, but now it ships in the box with newer versions of .NET. So it's generally not a dependency you pull in unless you're on the old .NET framework. Um, it's supported by Microsoft. It's a much bit safer bet in terms of we don't have to maintain that code, and we can focus on adding value in the actual client itself. Um, and we've moved what was essentially the low-level stuff into a, a library that we call Elastic.Transport, which is ultimately all of the things that deal with like uh, round robining of requests to different nodes, handling the HTTP, handling the serialization, um, that we could use for the basis of other clients or other, um, potentially other people could use it if they wanted to for any kind of distributed system where there's HTTP involved. So we've moved that functionality out into a more common generalized library that isn't uh, product specific anymore. And ultimately taken the opportunity to try and remove some of the legacy options, legacy code, and, and produce a cleaner API. I'll admit we haven't like 100% succeeded at that because by going down the route of code generation, you end up with some more generalized code. And so some of the types are a little bit harder to work with than we would like initially. Um, but we are going to be doing some things to build higher level abstractions over those repeatedly used areas that we find people uh, still find challenging. But the consistency with the API, the ability to make sure that the client is up to date all of the time is, is a much bigger win, I think, than some harder to use types. So we can actually jump into a demo for kind of the remainder of this session now and actually look at how we use the new client to talk to the cloud. So the first thing we're going to do is we've got our deployment here, and I'm going to need the password. So I'm going to copy the password. And I'm going to come into some code that I'm running here. And before we do anything else and look at the data, we're just going to set up an instance of an Elasticsearch client, uh, which takes this cloud ID that we'll grab in a minute. And in this case, we're just going to use what's called basic auth, where we have a username and password to connect. Um, don't expose passwords in real code. I'm going to paste in a password here, which is obviously not something that's a good practice. Um, put that into your secrets manager or your secret store, or at least environment variable or something uh, subtly more secure than in the code. Um, but for this demo, that's fine. And then I'm going to come over and actually just jump into the details for my deployment. Um, the reason we've got warnings here is because we've configured a single node. So it's not going to always be healthy if we lose the single region that we're running in. Um, and that's just a hint that we shouldn't consider this production ready. So I'm going to grab this thing called a cloud ID down here. And I'm going to paste that into this, oops, excuse me. I'm going to paste that into this string here. 
Um, and this is just basically a Base64 encoded uh, detail of the endpoint, but some other configuration information the client can use just to quickly get you set up. So you don't have to do anything else now to connect to Elastic Cloud. It will handle all of the certificate uh, pieces that we need there. Um, so in terms of what this app is actually going to do, if I open up my data here, <coughs> excuse me, um, if I open up my data here, you can see I've just got this big CSV file of stock data. It's five years' worth of stock data for 500 companies from like 2013 to 2018. Um, if we have a look, you can see it's um, around 620,000 rows of data, roughly. And it's just the, you know, the high, uh, high, low, close, and open values of the stock on those given dates. So that's what we're going to be storing. To model that, I have uh, in a, a basic class that has the properties that map to each of those columns. Um, I have a basic lookup here because the data doesn't include anything but the stock symbol. So just for some of the companies, I've added some lookups between the symbol and the, the company names so that when we um, hydrate the data from the CSV, we've got the full company name. And then we just have a little factory method here that reads a line of data from the file parses out the pieces that we need and ultimately produces a new stock data item. So this is just kind of application code um, for, to the dealing with getting my data from a, you know, a, a, an initial source. And we want to store this into Elasticsearch such that you can then search over it, obviously. So this application, we know we've got a brand new deployment, so we don't have any indices already in our deployment, but that might not always be the case. So the first thing I'm going to do before I set up my, my index is I'm just going to check whether one already exists. Um, and so in this case, on the client here, we can access these kind of like sub-areas. In this case, we're going to access the indices area, the index management piece of the endpoints in Elasticsearch. These typically align to the names you'll see of the subsections of the documentation. And uh, we're going to perform an exists request. Uh, we're going to use async. Typically, you want to be using async in your code. Um, and for the exists request, all we need is an index name, which we just have in this uh, constant string. Uh, sorry, my scroll is playing funny. Uh, we have it up here, so stock demo v8 is our name. So this request will come back, and on the response, one of the properties will tell us whether or not the index exists, and if it doesn't, we can do our configuration work. In the sense of uh, this application, what we're going to do is create an index. Um, now, this isn't absolutely necessary. If you send data to Elasticsearch with an index name that doesn't exist, Elasticsearch will create an index with that name. It will do all of that dynamic mapping that I talked about earlier to store the data in the generalized form, and then the data will be stored. But we already know some stuff about our data, so we're going to make sure we create it up front um, and explicitly map some of that data to the right types. And what I'm using here is what we call the fluent syntax, where we have this kind of dot notation to configure the request to create the um, index. So here what we're doing is the create async method it's generic. That might seem strange. It takes our data type. And what this allows us to do is simplify the process of mapping uh, properties on our data type to what we want to use in Elasticsearch. So we don't have to hard code a lot of strings. We can actually have the client infer the name of those fields for you. Um, and so by knowing about your data, we can make that easier. So the first prop um, argument here is the index name. And then we have this fluent configuration for our, our create index request, where we say we're going to create some mappings. In, under mappings, we define the properties we want to map. And here, we're going to say we actually want to sp specifically map um, the symbol property on our data as a keyword field only. So by default, Elasticsearch would dynamically map that as a text with the subfield as keyword. We're saying, actually, the symbol is never going to be searched in a full text form. It's only going to be sort of searched in its fully as is MSFT for Microsoft, for example, scenario. So we just want exact matching with a keyword field. And for the numbers, I'm explicitly mapping these as floats, because I know that my data source includes some numbers that don't include the decimal place. And so if one of those was the first document that was seen, Elasticsearch might infer that we actually want a long field. Uh, we know that's not true. And so when the second document hits with a decimal place, it would suddenly throw an exception. So making sure I map my data explicitly up front avoids that, uh, that potential risk. I'm also configuring some settings. So I've set number of shards one uh, for this index. Now, that's not what you'd necessarily typically do, but we know we only have one node in this deployment, so there's no point in me asking Elasticsearch to shard it, because it will just throw its hands up and say, well, I can't do that for you. Um, and we can't have replicas. Again, we don't have enough nodes. So again, not production settings, just a quick example. Now, that's the fluent syntax that you may or may not 
like. I prefer it. Um, but we also have what we refer to as the object initializer syntax, where if you want to, you can just new up the request object and all of its properties and sub-objects underneath. So here we create, uh, or we new up a create index request for this index name, and then we have to define mappings, which is of type type mappings, and that then has a properties property on it, uh, which accepts um, something that we can construct from a dictionary of property name and property type. And here we're hard coding now the, the symbol, the open, the close, the names that we're expecting to store in uh, Elasticsearch to the particular field types. So you can see this is more verbose. Um, it can be slightly more efficient in some scenarios. It might be easier to reuse portions of this across more than one piece of your application if you need to. But otherwise, um, I find it a little bit too sort of clunky for most scenarios. So fluent syntax is what I use. And then on the response, we're going to check whether if the response is not valid or the acknowledged property of the response says Elasticsearch couldn't create the index, then obviously we're in a problem. Uh, so we'd throw an exception. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and store data. Now, for Elasticsearch, um, one option we would have is storing data essentially document by document. So imagine this gets a single document from our data, you know, our data input file, and then we use the index method on the client to store that by passing the stock data and the index name, and then we serialize it and send it up, and Elasticsearch will store it. If we do that line by line in the file, that's about 619,000 HTTP requests we fire to the server. It will work, but obviously, that's a lot of network traffic. So for these scenarios, Elasticsearch offers what we refer to as the bulk endpoints that allow us to pass in multiple operations in one HTTP uh, request body. Um, and so to help you do that and make that simpler, we have this concept of a bulk all method that basically just accepts as the first argument an I enumerable of something. So here the read stock data just returns this I enumerable of stock data, basically yielding a parsed uh, stock data object line by line from the file for us. Um, once we've got the unnumerable, we can then configure how we want that bulk request to take place. So here we say, well, we want to index into this index name. Um, sometimes, if Elasticsearch is overloaded, it will tell us, hold on, back off. I can't, I can't accept any more data from you at the moment. I just don't have the resources. And in this scenario, we're saying, well, if that happens, if we get like a 429 response from the server, then actually back off up to 20 times. And each time, just give the server 10 seconds between our next attempt to send that data through. So this is where the helper just avoids you having to write all of that logic and wrap your request manually. We just kind of give you it behind the scenes. Drop documents is the concept of when we send up this batch of, say, 1,000 documents, um, hopefully they all get indexed. But if any of those documents have a problem, maybe the data within them conflicts with the mappings for that index and it can't be stored, then Elasticsearch will tell us that those particular documents failed. By default, when you do a bulk ingestion job, it just stops in that scenario and says, well, one of your documents has got a problem, so what do you want to do? In this case, what we're saying is actually continue if any of those get dropped. And just we pass in a callback to how to log basically the reason for each document's failure. So rather than you know indexing none of the documents or just a few, uh, we can say well index as many as you can, and if one or two don't work, just tell us why, and we can then you know we could have some kind of like queue where we store those and handle those uh, later on. We can parallelize the bulk request, so we can send multiple HTTP requests concurrently to kind of get better throughput of the bulk job. And then we configure the number of uh, documents we want to batch into each job. And we do this all for you uh, within the bulk process. This returns uh, an I observable. So um, basically, this work gets kicked off on a background thread, and we could run other code now while that's running. Um, in this application, I just want to wait until it's done. So we provide a helper, which is a wait observer that just will now block this thread um, until uh, the codes, uh, the data's all in. Um, we allow up to 10 minutes for that to take place before we cancel out. So hopefully that will all work. So I'm going to kick that off while we just sort of, or before we look at the rest of the code um, and let that build. So this is the, obviously the console output. So in a second or two, once the app kicks off, you can see now we get every, every 5,000 documents uh, returns a request. And in our um, wait callback, we configure that we just want to log the fact that data has been indexed into the console. So that's now just running through, um, putting, pushing that data in. And that's done. So that's half a million, well, over half a million documents now stored into Elasticsearch in Elastic Cloud. And we're ready to begin um, working with those. So we'll just go through a couple of quick scenarios. We don't have time for uh, as much as I'd like to show you, but um, let's think of a few search scenarios that we might have here. So the first is, OK, imagine that the business just wants to know, OK, give me the, 
for, you know, for, for particular stock symbols, say Microsoft stock, and give me the 20 most recent documents that have been stored into the server uh, for those. So for that, we perform a search request, just using search async here. Again, we strongly type things by passing in a generic argument that represents the data type for our, our documents. And what this allows us to do is when we get you the results back from the server, we can then deserialize the, the hits, uh, basically the results, into your data type for you from the server so you can immediately begin working with them in your application code. Um, what index we need to use, and then the query for this, the simplest, cheapest query you can perform in Elasticsearch for this scenario is actually just say, oh, well, I just need to filter down by the stock symbol in this case. So we're going to provide a bool query takes a filter. The filter type we're using here is a term, so we're going to say, look for the MSFT value on the documents on the symbol field and, and give me all the documents where that matches. Um, but obviously, we only want 20, so we have size 20, and then we sort in descending order. Um, if the response is invalid, obviously, we're going to throw an exception. But otherwise, on the response, we provide this documents property, which is that strongly typed collection now to your stock data objects that represents the, the 20 hits, hopefully, that we've retrieved from the server. We can loop over those and just write out the data to the console. So if I run this again, it's not going to re-index uh, the data because of our check for whether the index exists. Um, and you can see that's already completed. So our filter has occurred against that 600,000 documents, given us the top 20 most recent documents that we have in our data set uh, for the Microsoft stock there um, for the given days. So already that's you know, a fairly simple use case. Now imagine we want to do um, sort of full text searching against our data. So this is why I had that little dictionary to, to give us some full text search data that we could use. So now instead of actually searching specifically for one symbol, we want to say, well, find any of the company names that include, um, in this case, INC as part of the, the company name um, incorporated. So the search is basically the same. The only difference here is the query, where now we're saying, actually, we want to do a full text match uh, against a particular field, in this case, the name field for our query term INC. And it will give us back any documents where we've, we've stored that um, uh, in the inverted index for the data. Again, we can just loop over the documents to print those to the console. So um, outputting that data is pretty straightforward. And again, we have our data now. And the difference here is that for um, we have three companies worth of data appearing here. Uh, we have American Airlines Inc. with the capital INC. Uh, ink with a period after it, and then lowercase ink in here. So these are just trivial examples I threw in just to give an, a, a piece of data we could work with. But you can see through that process of that tokenization that happens by default on search text, um, all of these are basically treated as you know documents that contain ink. Um, the period and the casing have been dropped during that uh, indexing process. As I say, you can provide your own um, sort of tokenization and analysis flows for any of your field types to use different ways of stemming the data or breaking it down or, or normalizing it or maybe even uh, expanding words. So certain scenarios you might have like abbreviations in your data sets that may also be searched in a much more sort of verbose form and you could actually basically put those synonyms in through, through your um, indexing process as well. That's a really simple example here. Um, the final one is what it looks like to perform uh, what we call kind of a, an aggregation over some data. So this is where we're kind of doing some more data analysis rather than just searching text. And so here we're still performing a search, but the scenario here is what we want to do is get the total number of trades that occurred uh, for the Microsoft stock, but broken down by month. And so for this scenario, our query type is still a bool, a bool filter query to say just filter down to any documents where the, the symbol is Microsoft. We're not actually returning any actual hits here. We're not actually returning the matched documents. What we're doing is actually performing this set of aggregations underneath. And so for aggregations, we first want to bucket by month, which groups all of our documents that have been matched in that initial search into monthly buckets. And so to do that, we use the date histogram aggregation. We provide a name. This is just an arbitrary name you can use to retrieve the data in the results later on. Uh, and in this case, we're saying our calendar interval for the search is that we want to do everything by month, so interval month. Uh, we do it on the date field. And the order, this is one of the examples where the new code generated code is a little bit like clunky. You have to create this list of key value pairs to ultimately say that what we want to do is sort it by the, the key of the bucket, so whatever uh, date uh, each of the pieces of documents has been grouped together into, sort it by that, but in descending order. And then once we have everything 
aggregated once into those date buckets, we're going to perform another aggregation underneath, uh, essentially another kind of group by, that allows us to sum up the trade volumes field um, within those buckets. So we say for every document for, say, January 2018, uh, total up by summing the volume field. And that gives us this other sum aggregation underneath. In terms of accessing this data on the response, once we get the response back, we can access the aggregations property. We can then get um, any of the aggregations we expect to be in there. So in this case, we're expecting to find a date histogram aggregation called by month. Um, and then we want to access its buckets, which is just really the logical container of all the documents that occurred in that month. And then we loop over those months um, and we access the sum aggregation that was underneath it for each bucket and say get sum called trade volumes and access the value. The, um, the sum aggregation just returns the, the summed value. And so once we have that um, volume, we can just write out for the date using the bucket key um, and the total number of trades. So if I run this query, again, we filter down um, very quickly to the Microsoft stock, hopefully. And um, you can see here these last pieces of data that we've got. So for 2018 February, there was you know, 255 million trades. Uh, 2018 January, there was you know, over um, 574,000 trades. So we very quickly aggregated that data in a couple of different ways to analyze over all of the data that we've stored. So that's the kind of the client in, in, in a nutshell, really. Um, I'd love to show more of it, but uh, for time, I think we should probably wrap up with a few of the resources that are available, and then if there's time, we can just check if there's any questions. So in terms of resources that you might want to access, um, again, this is the link to this slide deck. So if you've got that link, then you've got the, this slide as well that includes the resources. Um, the repo for the Elasticsearch.net client is, is here. Um, so if you have any issues with the client, um, the V8 client is not feature complete yet with the, uh, the previous V7 client. We've kind of missed some endpoints while we've been doing this code generation work. So we urge you, if you're running into things that are missing um, and that haven't already got an issue, raise an issue and we'll try and prioritize those pieces of work around what people are missing. Um, this is our link to our documentation. Again, this is a little light at the moment. I'd like us to improve the docs dramatically for, for the .NET client with some more examples. Uh, the two packages, so Nest would be the V7 package. If you're talking to Elasticsearch V7, that's what you should be using. If you're talking to V8 and above, as long as we support the features you need, um, you can use the new client package. Um, and the link to the sample code that you've just seen um, is up on my GitHub repository, so that very basic kind of set of searches and, and data ingestion that we've just performed. And finally, the Discuss uh, community forums for Elasticsearch is a great place to go. If you haven't got a bug, to report on the actual repo, but you have a usage question, uh, whether it's about the client or Elasticsearch in general. If you head there, either one of our like community team will be able to respond, or the developers directly, um, or other community members. So that's pretty much it. Um,